Good evening. I want to thank uh, the elders at Woodstock and Matt Amos for the invitation to come and, and speak. Uh, it's also been very different for us. Uh, this is about the third or fourth video I've done and sent to others to have this summer series. But again, it, we adapt and we hopefully will still continue to encourage one another and lift one another up. I love summer series. I love going to other congregations and preaching. And I, and I really enjoy the fact of the encouragement that all these congregations give me. And I thank you. You have encouraged me at Woodstock in so many ways. The church at Woodstock has always been in my heart. I appreciate Matt Amos and the work that he does there. And I appreciate the elders and what they do and as they work for the Lord. I appreciate you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want you to know that you are in my prayers. And I encourage you to pray for the elders as they're having to make a lot of these hard decisions. I know some of these decisions that are made probably are not always 100% agreed with, but I also know speaking as an elder from South Cobb, that they have their heart and mind on trying to encourage and lift everybody up and continue to encourage and watch over the flock of God. Brothers and sisters, I think that this pandemic has helped us to realize what's really important. And it's brought home to me the importance of spending time with one another and how much I need my brothers and sisters in Christ, and how much we all need one another. And I hope and pray that we come out of this stronger than ever, also realizing that now we have more opportunities to spread the gospel than we ever have before. The church is not a building. I know it's talked about it in one sense as it is, in a metaphorical sense, but church is not what's done in a building, a brick and mortar building. Church is who we are. And again, this is what we need to realize that the church as it was, and I'm sure you've heard this before, needs to get out of the building and needs to become what we, and what Jesus intended for us to be from the very beginning. I think about as you meditate upon these things for just a few moments, how important it is that you have studied this very important topic of the works of the flesh and the work of the spirit. We need to be reminded of these things, especially in a world today that is giving itself wholly to the works of the flesh. There's a lot of discomfort. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of anger in the world today, and it manifests itself in the works of the flesh. And that's the reason why, as Christians, we have the right and the ability and the challenge now, it's been a challenge since the very beginning, to be the light to the world. Paul wrote to them to walk in the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Walk in the Spirit's words. Let the Spirit's words guide you into truth. Jesus, before he died upon the cross, will pray concerning his disciples, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that I they also may be sanctified by the truth. You see, Jesus emphasized the idea that the way we are sanctified, the way we're set apart, is by living by the truth of God's word. So this is the reason why Paul would encourage the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. As Paul encouraged this young preacher to stay in the word, so we must stay in the word. And always remember that this is given by the inspiration of God. And it's there to reprove us, to correct us, to instruct us. Oh, brethren, we need to be instructed so that we will be the light to the world, the city that is set on the hill, that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I fervently pray that as you've been studying this, you will think about it and that you will make sure that you are striving to be what God wants you to be. 
in Paul's discussion here in Galatians 5 of the works of the flesh, he, he kind of has a fourfold division. There was the sensual passions, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And again, when we are living in the flesh, this is what people will wind up striving to do. They're trying to find some something to fill the hole in their heart that only God can give. And so they try to seek it in so many different ways. So they seek it in sensual passions. They, they sometimes deal with trying to go after uh, Indian ideas, Hindu ideas. They sometimes try to find it in Muslim ideas. In that century, it was idolatry and witchcraft and sorcery and all these things along that line. Sometimes, because we allow the culture to affect the church much more than the church affecting the culture, we wind up engaging in hatred in the church, in strife, in jealousy, in wrath, in factions, in divisions, and a lot of times the heresies where you have those that are teaching things that should not be. Then you have also the envyings and the murders. And brothers and sisters, even though we may not pick up a gun and kill a brother or sister in Christ, we can separate ourselves from our brothers and sisters to the point to where we have nothing to do with them. And then the last thing he will use or talk about is the idea of intemperate excesses, such as drunkenness, revelings, and then to cover everything that he hasn't covered up to now, Galatians 5 verse 21, he says, and such like. And we know that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This evening, we're going to talk about the idea of selfish ambition and the idea as well of dissension. Think about the problem of selfishness. Now, if you're reading from the King James Version or the English Standard Version, you will find that this particular word from the Greek is translated rivalries. Rivalries. Does that abide, uh, uh, bother us today? Is it something that we struggle with today? You know that it is. We jokingly, but some brethren not so jokingly, talk about the rivalries in our football teams or our baseball teams. Think about the rivalry between Alabama and Georgia or Alabama and Tennessee or Tennessee and Georgia or any, any one of the teams in the SEC. There's, that, there's those rivalries there, and we, we're diehard fans. Sadly, sometimes this has caused problems in the Lord's church. I grew up in Alabama, and it was Alabama and Auburn, and you were either one or the other, and there was no middle ground. And I have seen brethren, sadly, take sides with their teams to the point to where it broke fellowship in the church. And, and, and you might sit back and say, surely not, but yeah. If Satan can find a way to divide us, he's going to do it. Think about in this country right now, we not only have faced the pandemic and we're struggling with how to deal with that, but we're also struggling with race relations. We are in the middle of discussions about this, but also we have seen the violence, the rioting, the protests. And you know, this has been going on since the 60s and so forth, and, and I believe it's going to continue to go on simply because Mankind is not striving to seek reconciliation through the gospel of Christ, but they're wanting to put forward or to have the rivalry of their race above another race. We need to have these discussions. It's necessary for us to listen, to understand, and to try to work on these things as brothers and sisters in Christ. We teach our young children, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves all the children of the world. But maybe we sit there and think to ourselves in our mind and have a disconnect. Yes, he loves the children, but he doesn't love the adults. Oh, listen, he loves every person upon this planet. And if you ever have a doubt about that, all you have to do is look at the cross. For God so loved the world. The world, not the red world, not the yellow world, not the black world, not the white world, but the world. We see selfish ambitions, and, and especially in a year like this, the, the political race is heating up, Republicans and Democrats, the Libertarian Party, the Green Party, the Constitution Party, and everybody has a platform. And everybody wants more than anything else to emphasize their differences rather than 
their commonality. Years ago, we fought a war in this country. And again, it was because we couldn't get along. We couldn't try to work things out. We couldn't compromise. And again, we're in that situation where it, it could easily explode into another war because again, of where we are. And we would like to sit back and think, no, such could never happen. But, you know, you hear rumblings of it. We struggle with selfish ambitions at work. There's always somebody that's always trying to crawl over everybody else to become the boss or to become a manager or to do something else. And there are always those where they're always suspicious of others at work because they're not sure if somebody's trying to get their job. They're not sure what their boss is trying to get them to do or what they need to do to be advanced in the company. There's rivalries at school. And again, I think about a lot of our young people and what they're having to face right now. And sadly, oh, so sadly, there's rivalries, selfish ambitions in the church. This is not in Galatians chapter 5, 20, the, the only passage that deals with this work of the flesh. In Romans chapter 2, as Paul talks about the sins that of <clears throat> the world and the Gentiles in chapter one, he now emphasizes again to the Jews. He says in chapter two, verse five, but in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But for those or to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what do they have to look forward to? Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Oh, I wish we would have learned that when it comes to the race relations we're going through. Back then, it was between Jews and Gentiles. But you see, do you hear what he's trying to say? He's emphasizing the idea he's treasuring up wrath for those who, what? Are self-seeking and do not obey the truth. That's why I started this lesson off with the idea of how important it is that we live the Christian life. Because brothers and sisters, we have to remember and realize that we are the only hope. No, God is the only hope, but the only way they're going to know about God is whether or not they see God in us. In James 3, he says, who is wise and one understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Notice again the emphasis upon the work. Notice the good conduct. But he said, if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. So he's saying that when we seek ourselves, when we seek what we want, it comes from the devils himself. And when self envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. I believe that some of the reasons maybe why we're going through the things that we're going through right now is because of the pandemic, is because of the race relations, but it's also because the devil is stirring us up. In Philippians chapter one, he even warns about preachers. He says, beginning in verse 15, he says, some indeed preach even from envy and strife, some also from goodwill, the former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely as opposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. And this is the reason why in Philippians chapter two, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Beloved, he emphasizes the idea that for us to deal with the self-seeking, the selfish ambitions, the things that we desire more than anything else, we have to remember that we have died to ourselves. Romans chapter 6. Whenever we become Christians, we put to death ourselves. We're buried with him, washing away our sins. 
and then we're raised to walk in newness of life. And it's no longer what we want. It's now about what Christ wants. This is the reason why he says, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why, and I believe he writes this in the context of Philippians 4 verse 2, where he's having to encourage a couple of ladies in the church. I beseech you and and Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. This problem of selfish ambition started in the Garden of Eden. Whenever Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve, he, though Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, made in the way that God wanted to, Satan left them the idea that they were missing something. As God said, you shall not eat of the tree. And she says, he says, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And he says, you shall not die. Satan always changes God's word, adds a little word here, takes a word out there. He appeals to her, and he says, this is a tree desired to make one wise, to make you like God. And I believe in 1 John 2, 15, where he says, do not love the world nor the things that are in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I believe Satan appealed to every one of those things in Genesis chapter 3. But notice he really appeals to the pride of life. And there again, there's where that selfishness comes in. He said, the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. God, by allowing man to have a choice, gave him the power to set his own course and destiny. And this is what happened when man sinned. God, being as loving as he is, will allow us to set our own course. If it's for self and selfishness, we cannot complain when we have to deal with the consequences of that course. This self-indulgence is found throughout all the pages of the Bible. Esau was hungry and traded off his birthright to Jacob, Genesis chapter 25 at verse 30. I mean, he said, I'm famished. I want something to eat. I want it to eat right now. The children of Israel, in their journeys to the promised land, and it wasn't very long that they got to a place where there was no water, there was no food, their food was running out, and they said, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat, Exodus 16, verse 3, and Numbers 11, verse 5. I often think about the fact how a lot of times we go back and think about the good times. When we do not have what we think we need, and is it not true that a lot of times we confuse need and want in our culture today? Then we wind up complaining and grumbling about this. In Ecclesiastes 6, verse 7, the wise men saw all the labor of a man is for his mouth, and yet his soul is not satisfied. There's so many examples as we can look at through the Bible of those that were selfish. Think about not only Adam and Eve, think about not only Esau, think about not only the children of Israel, but think about Absalom. We remember what happened when Amnon, his brother, took his sister, Tamar, had relations with her, waited on David to deal with the situation the way that he should, waited for two years and did not. David did not deal with Amnon. Why? When you go back, you remember the idea that David himself had committed sin with Bathsheba. He was only thinking about himself at that moment in time and had not thought about how this was going to affect the kingdom or anything else. He was wanting to engage in these relations. And as a result of that, could he really condemn Amnon for what he did? David did not handle it in the way that he should have. And so Absalom kills his brother Amnon. Then he runs to his grandfather. And after a period of time, he's finally invited back, but he's not allowed into David's court. And after waiting again for a while to talk to his father, 2 Samuel, as we read of this particular situation, he says, I could be a better king than my father, and leads in rebellion against 
his own father. Lives were lost. This selfish ambition of wanting to be a king caused children of Israel to be in a civil war with one another. After this, we see that as David comes close to death, Adonijah proclaims himself to be king. And we remember the circumstance how David has to come in and emphasize to everybody, no, Solomon is going to be king. And again, we find Adonijah seeking for and striving to have the kingdom. Read about it in 1 Kings chapters 1 and verse, or chapter 1 and also chapter 2. In Esther 6, verse 6, we read about another man by the name of Haman in a Persian court who was so full of himself, thinking about himself, says, whenever asked by Ahasuerus exactly what can I do to honor a man that I want to honor, he thought to himself, and again, he's so full of himself, he says, who else would the king delight to honor more than me? And we also remember, sadly, the, the sad tragedy of Haman, how he died on the gallows that he thought he was going to hang Mordecai on. We come to the New Testament, and it's interesting in Matthew, the 18th chapter, that as they were walking along the road, and, and, and it's not too hard for us to imagine, perhaps Jesus and was walking along the road, maybe a little bit separated from them, leading them as it was, and maybe thinking about <clears throat> who things that he was going to have to face. But what were the disciples doing? At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to them and set him in the midst of them and said, Assure last say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. You see, the disciples had rivalries. And they're asking, they asked, they simply asked Jesus, who's going to be the greatest? And I could sit back and think in myself that maybe Peter thought, well, you know, I'm the guy that's always the spokesperson for the group. Surely it'll be me. I'll be the one with the most uh, honor and, and respect. And later on, we're going to see in Mark chapter 10, verse 37, James and John, the sons of Devon, came to him and said, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. And he said, well, what do you want me to do for you? He said, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. Do you hear the selfish ambitions they have? Peter said to them, do you not, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And I don't know, but I see their chest thrown out a little bit. And they said, yeah, we can deal with that. And Jesus said, yeah, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and with the baptism I'm baptized with, but sit on my right hand and on my father." is not mine to give, but for those for whom it is prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Why? They were jealous. They wanted to be first, second, third in the kingdom. And Jesus reminds them all, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I started this lesson off by talking about the idea of how important it is that we always think about Jesus and think about making sure that we're not guilty of this selfish ambition, but we ought to realize that for us to be what God wants us to be, it's not that we're trying to seek honor and preeminence. We're trying to serve. And Jesus teaches them this in John 13, where right before he dies upon the cross, he washes his disciples' feet. Beloved, Jesus is the example Jesus is the example. And again, we have to realize that he gave up all to come down to this earth to serve us. There was not a selfish bone in his body. 
It was all about doing his father's will. It was all about us. And beloved, we have to die to self. Jesus will teach that, but that's part of the discipleship. If you want to be my servant, you have to die yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. A man that has selfish ambition seeks to glorify himself. And again, if he strives to seek to glorify himself, he will wind up destroying himself. Think about how Paul will emphasize the idea how important it is that we as members of the body always realize that we need one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. I can't cut my hand off. I need my hand. I need my eyes. I need my ears. I need everything, every part of the body. And as a body of Christ, as the church, we need every member of the body. When one part of the body hurts, all the rest of the body hurts with it. In October 2018, I was trying to cut down a limb off a, a dead limb off a tree, and the limb kicked back and hit me and knocked me off the ladder. I fell about 14 feet and broke my back in three places. And the doctors, that we did no surgery or anything like that, but the doctors did tell me in essence that um, I, I'm going to have to deal with this for the rest of my life. And recently, because of all the sitting I've been doing and also not getting out and exercising as I should, my back has been hurting me a lot more. So guess what? I'm getting up moving a lot more now. The reality is, is when one member of the body suffers, we all suffer with it. We in the church cannot be so self-centered. We cannot be self, so self-focused that we only think about ourselves. We must think about one another. And brothers and sisters, we need to remind ourselves of how desperately we need one another in the church. If this pandemic has done nothing, it has helped us to see how we need actual public assemblies. God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them. He said, if we were all with just one part, where would the body be? And so he says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Beloved, we need to deal with the selfish ambitions that's in our hearts. From the selfish ambitions, we now come to the second point, dissensions. When I want my way all the time, there's going to be problems. There's going to be problems in my marriage. There's going to be problems as a parent and as a child. How many of us have seen this child pitching a fit? We see it in babies. They, they a lot of times have to get their, our attention some way or another to, to take care of their needs. But then we really, in a sense, don't grow out of that. We, we still look at ourselves all the time. Sometimes some adults never grow out of it. How many churches have been destroyed because of selfishness? How many churches have, have struggled with that? And, and you think about it again, and, and one of the great passages that deals with this is 1 Corinthians, as I said earlier, 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3. Listen to what he says. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. That necessarily means we're going to have to talk to one another. And he says, it's been declared to you, to me, concerning you, my brethren, for though a Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. And what were they fighting over? Some say, I am a Paul. Some say, I am a Volus. Some say, I am a Cephas or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Do you hear the divisions that was going on, the dissensions that was going on? They were arguing amongst themselves over preachers. I often think about the idea of how preachers a lot of times have created that problem. But if a preacher is truly striving to follow Christ, that preacher wants what's best for the church. 
and will gladly do whatever's necessary for that to happen. Sometimes we don't even realize it. Paul will go on in Colossians or 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or chapter 3, verse 1. Brethren, I cannot speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Remember how he emphasizes the ideal again, walking in the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. So he's telling them, he said, I can't talk to you the way I need to because I have to talk to you as babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with solid food because you've not yet been able to receive it. And even now you're not able. One of the solutions to selfishness and one of the solutions to division in the church is for each and every member of the body of Christ to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is your responsibility for the good of the church. It is your responsibility to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, to grow up and be what you need to be. And he says, you are still carnal where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like men? Behaving like mere men. We can easily act like the world, but brothers and sisters, we have to be better than that. And that's why, again, in Philippians 4.2, he encouraged the church to encourage Yodi and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Sometimes we think that our way is the only way, the best way. And so one of the struggles that elders have to face is dealing with a hundred or 200 different opinions about the way all the things ought to be done. And let me tell you something, it's a hard decision to think about what's best for everybody. A lot of times the elders will try to deal with those that are most vocal. Beloved, again, we've got to think about every other member of the church. We have to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ to the point to where we can help our leaders that at times I may not disagree with their decisions, but I will do what they say because they're leading me. They may have information that I don't know, and I need to trust them. If every last one of us in the body of Christ would strive to be like Jesus, then truly, we would be the church that God wants and expects of us to be. Pride comes in. We want our way. A contention spirit comes in, and we struggle. We realize beyond a shadow of a doubt that the church is injured. And whenever, again, the selfishness comes in, the dissensions start, the division happens, it puts an end to Christian peace. Spiritual life is impoverished. People take hits that cause them to question God, cause them to question other members of the church. We are no longer striving to be the instruments of peace, but we now become the instruments of the devil. And so the world sees us. We go back and talk to our friends, not in the church, but outside the church. Well, that church down there, you know, the moment we use that phrase, that church down there, we are in essence cutting ourselves off from it. And we're ruining the the character and the usefulness of God's people. One man wrote that hatred, envy, reviling are the teeth of snakes and lions. They're the things that tear us apart. If Christians appear to bite and devour one another, the world will receive an impression of extreme cruelty in the characters of the followers of Jesus Christ. Could it be that they don't want to listen to what we have to say because we ourselves are not doing what we're supposed to? And as it often happens in the world, whenever we're trying to do what we want, we become like the world. We become consumed one of another. Galatians chapter 5, before he starts talking about that, he said, be, be careful that you don't devour one another. 
whenever we're arguing and fussing and fighting in the church, the contest will not end a victory in a victory to either party. It will end in a common extinction of the church. The Gentiles of that time, if they saw Christians quarreling, would repay, be repelled from Christianity. Converts would go back to their old heathenism, their old Judaism, and the Christian community might be entirely broken up. Every church has its problems. How often do we see splits in the church? How often have we been a part of something like that? And our hearts are broken, and we wonder, and we sit there trying to do our best to figure out what happened. We got away from Christ. We're not walking by the Spirit. We're walking by the flesh. And the only solution, the only solution that will keep us from doing that is love. The Galatian church had fallen into strife and bickerings. The church at Philippi had two ladies that were arguing amongst themselves, and it's interesting that he mentions them by name. Oh, brother, look at the church in Corinth. I mean, if there was a thing to divide over, they did it. There were divisions over preachers. There were divisions over the resurrection over how to partake of the Lord's Supper, the actual sin in the church in 1 Corinthians 5, and the warnings in 1 Corinthians 6 about sexual immorality, the ideal of giving, you name it, they've had a problem with everything. Again, if we're always fighting over these things, we're not going to be what God wants. Love is the solution. Love comes to set everything right again. It reminds us that I'm to love my brother as myself. And if I'm to love my brother as myself, we may have a disagreement, but I'm going to be there for him whenever he needs me. If I love my brother as myself, I'm going to seek reconciliation the way the Bible tells us to in Matthew chapter 18. If I have a problem with you, I will come and talk to you alone. Oh, beloved, so often in the church today, we go to social media, we go to talk about it, we become busybodies and gossips about what's going on. The gossip spreads to not only from that congregation, but to other congregations, and everybody's talking about what's going on there. And again, Whenever we have a problem with a brother, we are told to go in and deal with that problem between him and thee alone. We a lot of times jump and go ahead and talk to the elders. Well, I'm having a problem with so-and-so. The first things elders need to do whenever there's a problem in the church and it's between two brothers or two sisters is we need to tell them to go together and settle it out and try to work it out. And if they can't, then come and bring the elders into it. But a lot of times, we won't deal with it ourselves. We go talk to the elders and expect the elders to solve the problem. You go tell sister so-and-so. You go tell brother so-and-so. This is what they need to do. No, 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 no. You need to go. Jesus said you need to go. Then if that won't work, you take two or three more. If that won't work, you tell it to the church. And there are those opportunities where everybody could get involved to work through the problems. But we won't do it if we are continuing to live in selfish ambitions. Beloved, when we love one another, that secures the harmony and the social progress that we need in the church. A lot of times religious people are, are the world scorned because of the way they act. We ought to be the world's wonder because of our unity and our peace. And think about that, how that's so, so, so true. Over race. How we need to talk to brothers and sisters. How we need to treat one another as brothers and sisters. 
whatever is dividing us is the thing that we need to work on and make sure we're handling in the way that God wants us to. It starts with selfish dissensions. It then go or selfish ambitions, and then it goes to dissensions. And it's all permeated by a lack of love, a lack of growth, a lack of doing things that God wants us to do in the ways that he wants us to do them. Brethren, we are better than that. We are God's people. And my prayer is that through this lesson, it may encourage you. If you've got a problem with a brother or sister, you in love, Sit down and talk to God about it. Then have the courage to go and talk with them. And whenever you go and talk with that person, start off with a prayer. Get God in the middle of it. And then work the problem out. Beloved, we must do it Jesus' way. We must make a difference. And it is time for the church to rise up to be the church that it was in the first century. Yes, it had its problems, but it had its problems because Christians were walking according to the flesh, not the spirit. My prayer would always be that we walk by his word, follow his example, follow him as closely as we can so that we will have the peace and the joy that he wants for us to have. Let us pray. I'm thankful, Father, for this day. I'm thankful for the opportunity to share this message with the brethren at Woodstock. My prayer would be is that they would walk in peace and joy with one another, that they would truly try to put you first in their lives, that they would be known as a church in that community that helps others and that is united and that is peaceful. Help us, Lord, whenever the adversary is there to try to stop us. Help us to see him for who he is. And sometimes he might be disguised as a brother or sister. At the same time, Lord, help us to love. To love them enough to try to help them to make sure that they're where they need to be with you. Father, help us to deal with the sin in our lives. Help us to be your servants. I pray for the church at Woodstock. I pray for her elders. I pray for each and every member, whatever they're going through, whatever trial. Please be with them. And Father, walk with them as they walk with you. I humbly ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. And God willing, I'll be seeing you soon.